Hello, I'm Rooston Leno. Welcome to Verification Corner. We're going to talk about termination today. Termination of loops and termination of functions. Let me draw a prototypical loop on the board. Here's a simple while loop. The while loop is going to iterate as long as some condition B holds. And then each iteration it will do some statement S. How do we make sure that this loop terminates? Well, we associate with it a, um, a function, which is called a variant function, or a bound function, or a termination metric, or a rank function. And this function, uh, which is just going to evaluate to some value, at the beginning of the loop, we think right here, just before the evaluation of the guard, that is at the very top of the loop, we're going to, going to evaluate it to some value. And here, just before we're, we're about to return, to the top of the loop again. We once again evaluate what the value is. And we want to make sure that the, that the variant function, the bound function, is going to strictly decrease between these two points. If we can do that, we're on our way to proving termination. But there are two more things that we need to think about. Let me erase and show you an example. Suppose that, that our loop body does something as simple as um, it decreases some variable n. In this case, we could use n as that variant function uh, because it decreases, which is good. It strictly decreases every iteration. But it's not certain that this loop would, would terminate. Um, for example, um, the loop guard here might be uh, do this as long as and it's not zero, but it might be that n starts off as negative. In that case, this loop will, will never terminate. So the important thing is here that we also need to have, have a lower bound for the, for the decrements. So the lower bound in this example could be, could be zero, which would be fine if n starts off being non-negative. Then we can prove that this terminates. OK, so we need to make sure that it decreases. We need to make sure that it's bounded from below. But there's one more thing that we need to, to worry about. Let me erase again. Suppose that we admit uh, real numbers into our programming language, just for, for the sake of demonstration. So suppose that x is such a real number. And each time through the, the body of the loop, I will change x to be half of what it was previously. In this case, if x starts off being non-negative, we have again uh, we strictly decrease it each time through loop, and it is bounded below from zero. Yet this loop will, will not terminate. And the reason is that, that every iteration uh, through the, the, the decrement of x gets smaller and smaller. Um, so we will never reach zero, which is required for this loop to terminate. So in order to make sure that we, that we don't take smaller and smaller steps down uh, each time uh, through the loop, what we need to make sure is that the type of x is such that, that the, the, um, the steps will, will keep some, some minimum size. You can define that uh, quite uh, mathematically, usually having to do with some epsilon that has to be um, the, the, some lower bound on the decrements. But really, in practice, as the type of the variable is going, to, uh, is going to take care of this problem for us. So let's go to the computer and let's look, look at some examples there. All right, here we are at the computer. Let me show you that, uh, that simple loop that we started off with in, on the whiteboard um, in a slightly modified way. This is Visual Studio, and I'm using our research language, Daphne, because Daphne has the termination functions that I want to show you. All right, and it's a, it's a C-sharp-like language, um, so, the, um, so it looks object-oriented here. OK, so let's start off with a, with a simple loop. So what the simple loop will do is just iterate up to, up to n for some, some given n. Um, OK, so in this loop, what is going to be the, the bound function, uh, the, the variant function? Well, it's going to be something that decreases. And in this case, I wrote the i as something that, that increases. So we're going to have to, um, we could not use just i as the, as the variant function, but instead we'd have to use minus i, for example. 
So here you can see if I hover of, with the mouse over the, the while statement that we're getting the, the complaint that um, the decreases expression, which is our variant function, does not decrease. Well, that's because I have not even given one yet. So uh, let me declare decreases. And again, we cannot use i, but we could use uh, minus i because minus i is something that does decrease. Uh, but then remember, a decreases expression, a variant function, must be something that is bounded by zero. Um, or bounded below. So it turns out that Daphne always uses zero as that lower bound. Um, so, uh, so in this case, minus i could be uh, quite negative, but, the, um, but if we start off, if we take the, the decreases function to be n minus i, that is something that, that will always be, uh, be non-negative. So here we are. That, uh, that proves the termination of this loop. OK, that was simple. Let's, um, let's try something a little bit different. Let's try a function. And I will I'll give you a, a simple function, uh, which is often used, which is the Fibonacci function. So the Fibonacci function, uh, as you're familiar with, uh, computes just itself for the first two, um, for the first two numbers, uh, 0 and 1. And otherwise, it's the sum of the previous two numbers generated. So in this little uh, Daphne function, I've shown uh, the definition of Fibonacci. The complaint that we're getting is a failure to decrease the termination measure, which happens uh, for a loop. It happens at the end of the of the loop iteration, but for functions that we're trying to prove to, to terminate, it happens at the at the time of the recursive call. So again, the we have not associated a termination metric uh, with this function. So let's do that. And in this case, the thing that decreases with every call is the parameter n. So all we need in this case is just decreases n. Then when we get to the, um, to the recursive calls, here we're passing in n minus 2. Here we're passing in n minus 1. So now, what happened with the, with the boundedness, the bounded from below? Well, uh, Daphne knows that, that these two function calls, the recursive ones, happen only if n is at least 2. So therefore, um, at the time of the recursive calls, uh, everything is still fine. The things are, are bounded. OK, that's, um, that's that little example. Let me show you another one. Uh, another mathematical function, since we're into those. So here's the, um, the famous Ackermann function. Ackermann, uh, the Ackermann function is more complicated, and um, uh, we don't need to know much about it in this, this example other than staring at its definition. What you can see is that it takes two parameters, m and n, both integers, and it makes some recursive calls. Um, so. In the, in the first of the three branches, there's no recursion at all. But in the other two cases, the, there's either one recursive call or two recursive calls. So what are we going to associate as the termination metric here? Well, I write the decreases function. And we might try one of the parameters, which would seem, uh, seem pretty good, maybe. Um, well, what we can see now that is that the verifier tells us that the first call was just fine. The first call does decrease m at the time of the recursive call. And so does the one of the other two calls. But this call leaves m the same. So that's not a, that's not a good uh, termination function that we have chosen. Well, we can see for this one that it decreases n. So let's try that as the termination function. So let me um, change the termination metric here, the decreases function, to n instead of m. Well, now we're fine for the third of the recursive calls, but not for the other two. For example, this one always passes in 1 for n, whereas n started off with something that was non-positive. So that doesn't work either. So what are we going to do? Well, the Ackermann function needs a slightly more complicated termination metric. It needs a lexicographic pair. So a lexicographic pair is like sorting names alphabetically in the phone book. Um, so I'm going to give a list of functions. In this case, I'll give it m followed by n. So the, the m comma n function is the lexicographic pair which decreases if either m decreases. In that case, it doesn't matter what, what n does. It can go up or down. Or it's also OK if m stays the same as long as n decreases. In those cases, the, the function will strictly decrease. And in fact, in this case, the verifier has already verified for us that that is, that that is a, a good termination metric. Um, in this case, we can see that m goes down. Here also m goes down. In this case, m stays the same, but n goes down. And therefore, the whole thing terminates. OK, that was the uh, Ackermann function. Let me show you one more example. 
Um, in this last example, uh, it's going to be a, a little bit hairier. Uh, we're going to have to do more things to, in order to prove termination. But we're all up for the challenge. So here is the, um, here's a simple linked list implementation. Uh, and it's simple because it's missing some of the functions you would expect. But, but let me show you what, what I have here. So I'm using a class list. Uh, it has two data members. Uh, it has a data field which stores an integer. And it has a next field which points to the, to the rest of the list. And my intention here is that all of the lists are represented as acyclic lists. The singleton method takes one in parameter and it creates and returns a list as an out parameter. And the, um, the out parameter is just going to have that given x as its, as its data member. So no surprise in its, in its body here. The prepend function takes both an element and a, and a given list. And it, what it will do is it will extend that list at the head of the, of the list. And it will return the result. And again, no surprise, it allocates a new linked list node, sets the data field, sets the, the next field to the given tail. Um, and everything is cool. All right. So now let's write a sum function that is going to sum up the elements of the, of the linked list. So I have the, the function prototype done here. And we're going to have to look at the, at the next field. So I will check here if next is null, then the thing we're going to return is just data, because then the sum of all of the elements is just uh, of that, um, the, the data element for that um, node itself. Else, it's going to be data plus the sum of the rest of the list. So uh, we do that by invoking the sum function on the next of the list. Now, um, you're noticing here that, uh, oh, yes, it's complaining about uh, a reads clause. I don't care about reads clauses in this example. I'm, I don't want to demonstrate them. So let me just say reads star, come back to a different uh, verification quarter, and I will talk more about those. OK, but, the, uh, but what you will notice here is that we do have a recursive call. That is, we call the sum function, which we're defining here, we're calling that on the next field. So why does that terminate? Well, it terminates because the list is acyclic. If the list is acyclic, there are only so many next steps you can do. And eventually, you will get down to the, to the base case, which will just return data, and the recursion terminates. But how are we going to convince the verifier of this fact? Well, that will take a little bit of uh, work. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to store in each linked list node the set of all linked list nodes that, um, that comprise the, the, the whole list. I will do that by going back here to the top. And I will introduce a variable uh, for that purpose. And it's going to be a ghost variable, which means that it's a variable that's used only in the specification of the program. We don't need to actually uh, uh, compile this function, uh, compile this uh, data member in the, in the running program. It's only here for the specification. OK, so what is, is it going to be? Um, so let me call it the um, uh, tail nodes. Um, or I can call it list nodes. Maybe that's a better name. Uh, list nodes, and that's going to be a set of set of nodes, set of uh, list items here. Okay, so uh, with this, I can now store into the list nodes of an object the set of all nodes that make up the list. But I need to say something about that as well. I need to at some point explain to the verifier which things I'm going to put into the set. So for that purpose, let me write another function. And the function is going to be called acyc is acyclic. It will return a boolean. And, um, and again, I don't care about the reads clauses in this demo, so I'll just make that reads star. And um, now we need to say what it means for a node to be acyclic. Um, well, one thing is that we want the, uh, the list nodes field to be, uh, to be accurately represented. So we're going to say that the, the object itself is indeed part of list nodes. Otherwise, um, this object is not even well formed, and we don't really care to say much about it. But we want to say a little bit more, and that is that if the next field of the object is not null, then a number of things have to happen. We're go going to say, first of all, that the next field, uh, which also has a list nodes, its uh, list nodes is a subset of the list nodes of the current object. Um, and we're going to say, furthermore, that, that the object itself is not part of the, the list nodes of the next guy. And that's important. It's just 
exactly this conjunct which is going to tell us that, that the list is acyclic. But we need one more thing, which is that we need to make a recursive call to, the, uh, uh, to make sure that the rest of the list is acyclic. We don't want a, a lasso at the, at the end of the list here. So I will use the same function again. So here is our definition of, of acyclic. But now, acyclic is also a function. And Daphne is going to check that all functions are, are well defined, which means that they're, they're not allowed to loop forever. And at this point, we see a failure to decrease the termination measure. So in fact, the a, is acyclic function also needs a termination measure associated with it. So let's do that. Um, and the termination measure is going to be that it's going to decrease the set of list nodes of the, of the object on which we're invoking it. And that takes care of, um, of the termination of, of is acyclic. You can see to begin with, it's the, the decreases function evaluates to list nodes of the current object. And here, when we invoke it on next, it's going to be the list nodes of the next object, which by these two conjuncts, we've said is a strict subset. OK. So now we can decorate our other functions a little bit, our other methods uh, with the ace is a cyclic predicate, just because we have it. So what we're going to ensure for the singleton is that the list that is returned is indeed a cyclic. And for the prepend function, we're going to insist that either tail is null or the tail is acyclic. And in the end, we can guarantee that the list that we return is acyclic. OK, so let's see what happens with, with those. Now we get the number of complaints. One complaint is here that the post condition of singleton might not hold. The reason for this is that we need to make sure that the list really is acyclic. But being acyclic says something about the list nodes field. And we have not set list nodes to anything. List nodes is just a, a ghost field. So it works as any other field. The only difference is that it's not part of a compiled program. So what we need to do is we need to set the, the list nodes set the field here to some value. And in this case, it's going to be uh, the singleton uh, consisting of the list itself. OK, let's see if that one goes away, and it does. OK, good. Here's the, um, the next problem. Prepend also needs to, needs to have something done with the, with the list nodes. And that's a little bit more complicated, but we can do it. It's going to be here, um, the, again, we, we're going to look at if tail is, is null, then it's simply going to be the, uh, the singleton list. Else, it's going to be the singleton list union the, um, the list nodes of the tail. Let me scroll down a little bit here. And we should see. Um, uh -huh. Semicolon. OK, we see that, uh, that go away. And now we're finally back. So what we've done right now is we added the list nodes ghost field, and we added the is acyclic uh, function. And we, we instrumented the, the methods to their specifications to talk about the acyclicity of these lists. So now we're back to the sum function, which was our original goal to try to specify that sum indeed uh, terminates. And now we can finally do it. We need to do two things. Uh, one thing is we need to say that it decreases the, um, the list nodes, uh, which is just the same as we had to do for the acyclic. But we need to do one more thing, which is that, um, and we should see it here soon. Um, OK. The, uh, the problem is also that we need, we need to make sure that the sum is only applied on acyclic lists, because we would not actually be decreasing list nodes if it were on a, on a cyclic list. So, so we require of this function that you can apply it only on, on acyclic lists, and then all is good. So with that, the, we have proved that the sum function uh, terminates. And again, that was a lot more work because we had to, we had to go and specify the acyclic, acyclicity of the lists uh, and so forth. But those are, are things that you probably would have done to prove the, the correctness of the program in, in other regards. So the adding the termination to it comes down to just adding the decreases line once we have the, the other uh, things defined.
All right, let's summarize what we've learned. To prove that the loop terminates, introduce a termination metric associated with the loop and make sure that the termination metric has three properties. The first property is that the termination metric strictly decreases with, the, with each iteration. The second property is that it's bounded from below. The third property is that it, when it decreases, it doesn't decrease in smaller and smaller steps, but instead the de decreasing uh, stays above some, um, some decreasing threshold. The last of those is typically ensured by just the type of the expression. And do the same thing for recursive functions. Um, this, just introduce a termination metric for those as well. This has been Verification Corner. I'm Rustin Leno. Program safely. Verification.